a chaotic situation, very public shooting, the police officer shot and the suspect dead. Kids in crisis need more help than they're getting, so some doctors decide to come up with their own solution. A politician taking credit for someone else's accomplishment. You don't say, but we will in our latest truth test. They will have to not only think outside the box, but literally think outside our planet. Colorado School of Mines is working on moon problems. We need to figure them out before we go back for an extended stay. And that mountaintop music session wasn't just for entertainment. We'll learn about something called musician conditioning on next. We begin tonight with an update on that Denver police officer shot this afternoon while tracking a fugitive in Broomfield. The shooting that injured the officer and killed the suspect played out right along Sheridan. This is at Midway Boulevard, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Neighborhoods not far from Broomfield Commons open space. Broomfield police say Denver police's fugitive unit was up there tracking a suspect connected to a homicide. They see he was driving a car that crashed into another vehicle. Investigators say the suspect tried to carjack somebody else before running away. And in the process, Broomfield police say that suspect fired at officers. They shot back, hitting and killing the suspect. Denver police say one of their officers was shot in the neck. But we were just recently told that things are looking stable. That officer is expected to survive. As more and more kids turned up in emergency rooms in the middle of having a mental health crisis, Health One doctors realized that Colorado simply did not have enough places to get help for those young people. So they decided to come up with a solution of their own. Here's Anusha Roy. We're failing our children. Stephanie Camacho started seeing so many kids come through their emergency room. I have a child around that age as well, and it's you know, it's very hard to not kind of personalize those experiences. The kids are getting younger and the severity of their problems are becoming more intense. We are not children's hospital. And doctors don't always know where, where to turn. Where do we go? Um, we, we just didn't have an answer to that. That's because there isn't always an answer. There's a shortage of help across the board, especially for intermediate help, something in between inpatient help and therapy once a week. The kind of help that can keep a kid out of the emergency room. And why Health One Behavioral Health and Wellness Center started expanding those kinds of services for kids, especially after watching what was happening in the community. The schools also are struggling to right, provide the supports, um, and they can't be the only support. Boulder Valley School District said they were lucky enough to fill four open counselor spots, but that it's been a really tough market. Jeffco Schools is using COVID relief dollars to build up telehealth services, and DPS is trying to fill four open spots and placing interns studying to be counselors in schools in the hopes to hire them full time down the road. We're seeing that come up and we really work intentionally to build even those referral pathways. The reason that intermediate care is so lacking is because it's tricky to set up. Highly intensive in environment. You have to have different types of spaces and staffing for those kinds of programs. Uh, and the other barrier is actually insurance. So Medicaid does not pay for the partial level of care um, or day treatment in some circumstances. That means some kids are treated and then they go back into the community and don't always have enough support and could end up back in the emergency room. It's also why Children's has been expanding these kinds of services as well. Our kids do have a lot of resilience. They can actually overcome a lot of things, but we need to support them. There are so many factors here, right? The impacts of COVID, that outpatient care isn't always close by or available. So that intermediate help, it can look at like several days of therapy in a week. You're working in groups or individual settings. Both health systems said that they are working off referrals, but also that families can call them directly and that not everybody knows about this so that they are waiting for your call. Nusha, you've been reporting on the, the pediatric mental health crisis in Colorado for a couple of years now. It seems like there's such agreement that this is a big issue for our state. And it's always shocking to hear the ages of the kids involved, how young some of them are. Yeah, I mean, Children's was saying that they're seeing more and more kids between 12 and 16 come in to their emergency rooms, but that they're also seeing kids younger than 12. And the thing about that is that the younger the kids, the harder it is to actually get these resources. And it's not just that they're younger kids coming in, it's that they're coming in even sicker than what they've previously seen, which is just, is just heartbreaking. At the very least, it's all hands on deck now about yep. this. Appreciate your continued work on it. Thank you, Nusha. Denver International Airport is a huge economic driver, so it's, it's money matters. The airport expects traffic to rise above pre-pandemic levels next year, and there's going to be a new person in charge of that $1.3 billion budget if Phil Washington is confirmed to lead the FAA and leaves town. 
That nomination by the White House is not really moving while Washington is under investigation for what happened at his last job in L.A. Awkward indeed. Sure was when it came up at a city council budget session. What do you expect now to happen with the White House? That's a great question. Uh, <laughs> and no, no one's watching this on TV, so don't worry. Oh, and totally okay, budget well, related, you know, right? You know. um, well, well, it is to the extent it is to the extent that you know Phil has been the driving force behind a lot of these changes. Well, so much for this not ending up on TV. Here it is. And Mayor Mike, Michael, Han Michael Hancock did not seem to really appreciate that line of questioning from City Council. With all due respect, probably not a fair question for Phil to ask in this forum. Um, obviously, what's happening in L.A. Can, creates a kind of a political kerfluffle, if you will. Um, and we'll allow that to play out. And Phil has committed to continue to do his job uh, while he is the CEO of DEN. And so while uh, we hate to see Phil go, we're excited he's going to stay here until whatever they decide to do in Washington. Den, of course, is what the city wants us to call the airport. Uh, airport's actual name, of course, is DIA. We both know that. As for the kerfluffle, Washington insists he is not under investigation, though he is named in a search warrant. A colleague alleged in court documents that he did a favor with a contract for a nonprofit to try and get on the good side of an elected official. There's no I in team. But there is in the political ad paid for by Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold as she takes credit for accomplishments that were not entirely her own work. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger explains in his latest truth test. I'm Jenna Griswold. Democratic Secretary of State Jenna Griswold makes four distinct claims in her political ad. It's why I expanded in-person voting. Yes, but it was the state legislature that ultimately passed the bill that changed the election laws in Colorado, changes that have come with input from county clerks. A bill in 2019 updated how many in-person voting centers must be open based on the county's population. It also added in-person voting centers on college campuses. They're called voter service and polling centers, and there are around 350. In-person voting, though, does not impact most Colorado voters. In June, 1% of primary votes were cast in person. 99% turned in a mail-in ballot, the same percentages last November. And in the 2020 presidential election, 6%, not quite 200,000, voted in person. Launched a statewide system so every voter could track their ballot. Yes, it's called ballot tracks. Increased ballot drop boxes by over 65%. Yes, but with help. The increase in ballot drop boxes was part of the 2019 state legislation that also added in-person voting centers. It also also added drop boxes to college campuses. The number of drop boxes also increased because counties could get the cost covered through CARES Act funding. And passed automatic voter registration, registering over 350,000 eligible Coloradans. Saying she passed automatic voter registration is a stretch. It existed before Griswold. She helped modify how it works with a bill passed by lawmakers in 2019. Starting in 2017, drivers getting a license or updating their address at the DMV would be asked if they wanted to register to vote. You could decline on the spot. Now, because of that 2019 bill, you cannot decline to be registered to vote at the DMV. The DMV shares your info with the Secretary of State's office, which shares it with your county clerk. Then you get sent a mailer. You can opt out and not be registered to vote, pick a party, or do nothing and be registered as an unaffiliated voter. That's why there's so many unaffiliated voters now. I don't show it, but at the end of the ad, Griswold stands in front of a ballot box with people appearing to drop ballots off. I found out that video was shot in August. The ballot box was not unlocked, and the people were essentially taking paper to the ballot and then sticking it to tape so it looked like it disappeared. Ah, it's no like special favors involved in that. No. So, okay, so this is interesting. So you flip on MSNBC pretty much any night of the week, and you're going to see Secretary Griswold on there dragging election deniers uh, and, and uh, the folks who think that, you know, mail-in ballots are rigged, machines are rigged, or whatever else. And you thought it was noteworthy the first claim that she puts in this ad. You look at the claims, and the first one impacts a small number of people about uh, in-person voting. And the people who are big on in-person voting are the ones that don't want to turn in a mail ballot mm -hmm. are the election conspiracy theorists. So why of all the claims is that the one front and center at the top of the ad? It just it stuck out to me, especially one percent in the most recent election. Fifteen thousand, not even enough people to fill ball arena. Interesting. So you think that might be a nod to people who might not totally trust the election. Interesting. I don't know.
All right, all right. Hey, while you're here, uh, we are getting some feedback actually on another one of the truth tests about ballot propositions that would allow wine in grocery stores and third party delivery of alcohol at home. A couple of people wrote in there were just like, well, I'm buying booze at my grocery store all the time. This has kind of widened out in the last couple of years. Right, and I'm here because I, I slip of the tongue yesterday. I said there was only one store for like grocery change that could have it. So like the King Super Safeway could only have one. You can have up to eight that sell wine and liquor, but to do so, the grocery chain must buy out two retail liquor stores, including all the liquor stores within 1,500 feet of that store. Yesterday, I did say it was just the one. So people reached out and said, hey, the, the store by me has it. Why, do we, why are we even voting on this in the first place? It's to do away with that limit and let everyone have a chance at it, not just the limit of eight. So then presumably we could see what they tried to avoid in the past, which is a supermarket selling wine right next to a liquor store. Right. And, and I mean, the legislatures have done enough to try to make sure that doesn't that, that it doesn't impact the liquor stores, that, that if that's going to happen, the grocery chain is buying you. Is out. buying them out. All right, Marshall, thank you. There's a proven way to save water and reuse it at home, yet fewer than 50 homes in Colorado do it. Another city wants to give it a try. And there's another city with stinky tap water. Same problem as the first one, same solution on the way. And it turns out there's a lot more to the story of the clarinet players in their mountaintop concert. We'll hear from them next. The state recently audited to see if our veterans are getting the benefits they've earned. And the audit found county level veteran service officers are often underpaid, underpaid, undertrained, or just unavailable to help. And in bigger cities, getting in touch with one of those service officers was especially difficult. The United Veterans Coalition of Colorado helps direct veterans to these service providers, including the VA, and they say that they're hearing from veterans coming back unsatisfied veterans who want to use them somehow get the impression that I've got to go see the, the VA person rather than the VA person coming to see me. Um, somehow they, they feel that the VA is kind of a place where the person sits there in a desk and says, well, when someone opens the door, I'll help them. But until they open the door, I'm going to sit here, which means that we have a heavy turnover of veteran service officers in the county uh, because they're not paid very well. And to give you some idea, the audit says some counties are given as little as $8 an hour to pay their veteran service officers. Others get as much as $50 an hour. Still keeping a close eye on Hurricane Ian. Yes, still a Category 1 storm. It is now out into the Atlantic, but look what happens. Its track continues to the northward and then hooks back into the Carolinas. Right now it looks to push close in toward Charleston by tomorrow afternoon. Across downtown Denver and beyond, we've been watching just a couple of ice little showers filtering in. These all move out tonight, and tomorrow morning actually should be a pretty nice start to the day. A warm day, slightly above average, but I am tracking a cold front pushing through. That's going to usher in some pretty heavy showers up into the high country with a few storms by about 5, 6 o'clock on your Friday evening here in Denver with a better bet later on in the evening. Highs returning to the 70s and 80s here for eastern Colorado, 50s and 60s way up high. There's that front. It sneaks in and finally gives us a nice taste of fall as we head into October this weekend. Those temperatures dropping off into the 60s early next week. Thank you, Danielle. Another city in Colorado is giving people a way to reuse and save water. It's an expensive way but an increasingly popular one being looked at. Grand Junction will allow gray water systems to be installed now. Homes could reuse water from their showers, sinks, bathtubs, and washing machines to go through again to flush toilets. Gray water systems are not cheap. They can cost up to $5,000 per home. Grand Junction is applying for grants to try and set up incentives for homeowners. Fort Collins also adopted gray water use this year. Fort Collins Utility says there are only about 30 homes statewide reusing gray water. Our next question, stinks. Stinks like the tap water in Inglewood these days. A next viewer named Tommy wanted to know why. Tommy Inglewood tells us they've been aware of what they call aesthetic issues with their water for years. Aesthetic issues being a nice way of saying the water smells, especially common in the summertime when algae is blooming in the South Platte. Denver had a, a similar funky bunch of water last month. In both cases, the water providers tell us it's still safe to drink. It's been treated and the smell should tamp down as the algae dies off in the fall. Send us questions about anything you think stinks in the state. Just email us at 9news.com. Maybe you've never thought about how to sweep up 
moon dust. But there are mines in Colorado working to solve the problem that needs to be dealt with if humans are going back. And the musicians who strapped clarinets on their backs for a 14,000 foot hike tell us they did it for science. That's next. Let's learn a new term, at least it was to me, lunar regolith. Fancy way of saying moon dust. The lunar regolith is chock full of stuff that might one day be useful to people living on the moon. We obviously then need to be able to collect it, move it around, that kind of thing. So School of Minds has asked the smart minds at Minds to come up with a way to work with that moon dust. Nowadays, the students are obviously learning the basics of engineering, but now we're changing the challenge. The same thing that we did here on Earth, how do you apply it to space? The dust on the surface of the moon is extremely fine. It's like flour. My name is Angel Abud Madrid. I'm the director of the Center for Space Resources at the Colorado School of Mines. We are organizing a student competition. It's called the Over the Dusty Moon Challenge. So this whole part, transporting lunar dust from one place to another, is what the competition and the challenge is all about. We want to use the dust on the surface of the moon for a variety of reasons. You can process it and extract the oxygen out of that. You can use it as material for construction. And so what we want to do is have the dust go to a processing plant so we can extract the oxygen or the water or the metals. We don't want the large rocks that can damage the processing plant. So during the challenge, uh, students may, will have to come up with a way to sieve this, to get rid of these rocks and then only transport the dusty material from one place to another. And do it in a way that utilizes very little power, very compact, and very a little volume. This is the future for the next generation of students. They will have to not only think outside the box, but literally think outside our planet. That's pretty cool. Hey, you helped us connect with two mystery musicians we saw playing a clarinet concert on top of Mount Bierstadt. They're clarinet professors Stephanie Zelnick and Lauren Jacobson. It turns out they do this quite a bit. For them, it's a form of physical conditioning to make them better musicians. You know, we have really long careers, uh, you know, sometimes 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And uh, we do it without a lot of physical conditioning support or attention to musician health. Uh, as opposed to, you know, something like athletes, where they get a lot of support and research on what they're doing. They have hiked Bierstadt, they've hiked Mount Audubon, a 13er in Boulder County, and next they're headed for the big daddy of them all, Mount Elbert, the highest point in the Rockies. Zelnick and Jacobson just kind of accidentally stumbled into public exposure for their project when they got videotaped up there. They're calling their work Summit Music. They're trying to raise awareness about the importance of physical and mental health for classical musicians. Your feedback about whether we are fair with our political truth tests. Next. Tonight, Beth writes, I know you must try to be equally hard on both parties, but your hair-splitting analysis of Jenna Griswold's ad was a bit nitpicky. Why not focus on misrepresentations that are significant? I'm glad you caught that. Our goal is to apply the same standard to both parties, and this time the standard is to tell the truth. I'm glad that you can tell the difference between calling out small infractions and the complete horse excrement from some.